and it was to the smiles of all of them that we walked out of the theater and onto the fog weathered streets my dear fellow i said whatever was not another word said my friend there are many ears in the city and not another word was spoken until we had hailed a cab and clambered inside and were rattling up the cherry cross road and even then before he said anything my friend took his pipe from his mouth and emptied half his smoked contents of the bowl into a small tin he pressed the lid onto the tin and placed it into his pocket there he said that's the tall man found or i'm a dutchman now we just have to hope that the cupidity and curiosity of the limping doctor proves enough to bring him home to us tomorrow morning the limping doctor my friend snorted that's what i've been calling him it was obvious from footprints that much else besides when he we saw the prince's body that two men had been in that room all that night a tall man who unless i miss my who unless i miss my guess we have just encountered and a smaller man with a limp who eviscerated the prince with the professional skill that betrays the medical man a doctor indeed i hate to say this but it is my experience that when a doctor goes to a to the bad he is a fouler and darker creature than the worst cutthroat there was hurston the acid bath man and campbell who brought the pro -crust pro bed to ealing he carried on in a similar vein for the rest of our journey the cab pulled up beside the curb that'll be one and and temperate ten pence said the cabbie my friend tossed him a florin which he caught and tipped his ragged tall hat much obliged to you both he called out and the, as the horse clopped out of the into the fog we walked to our front door as i unlocked the door my friend said odd our cabbie just ignored that fellow on the corner they do that at the end of a shift i pointed out indeed they do said my friend i dreamed of shadows that night vast shadows that blotted out the sun and i called out to them in my desperation and they but they did not listen part five inspector lestrade was the first to arrive you've posted your men in the street asked my friend i have said lestrade with strict orders to let anyone who comes in who comes but to arrest anyone trying to leave and you have handcuffs with you in reply lestrade put his hand in his pocket and jangled two pairs of cuffs grimly now sir he said while we wait why do you not tell me what we are waiting for my friend pulled his pipe out of his pocket he did not put it in his mouth but placed it on the ta on the table in front of him then he took the tin from the night before and a glass vial i recognized as one as one he had had in the room short in shoreditch there he said the coffin now as i trust it shall prove for our master of renette he paused then he took out his pocket watch laid it carefully on the table we have several minutes before they arrive he turned to me what do you know of restorationists not a blessed thing i told him lestrade coughed if you're talking about what i think you're talking about he said perhaps we should leave it there enough's enough too late for that said my friend for there are those who do not believe that the coming of the old ones was the fine thing we all know it to be anarchists to a man they would see the old ways restored mankind in control of its own destiny if, if, if you will i will not hear the sedition spoken said lestrade i must warn you you i must warn you not to be such a fathead said my friend because it was the restorationists that killed prince franz drago they murder they kill in vain effort to force our masters to leave us alone in the darkness the prince was killed by a rage it's an old term for a hunting dog inspector as you would know if you'd looked in a dictionary it also means revenge and the hunter left his signature on the wallpaper in the murder room just as an artist might sign a canvas but he was not the one who killed the prince the limping doctor i exclaimed very good there was a tall man there that night i could tell his height for the word was written at eye level he smoked a pipe the ash and dottle sat unburnt in the fireplace and he tapped off his pipe with an ease on the mantel something a smaller man would not have done the tobacco was an unusual blend of shag the footprints in the room for the most part had been obliterated by your men 
but there were several clear prints behind the door by, and by the window. Someone had waited there, a smaller man from his stride, who put his weight on his right leg. On the path outside, I had several clear prints, and the different colors of clay on the boot scraper outside gave me more information. A tall man, who had accompanied the prints into, the, into those rooms, and had, later, walked out. Waiting for them to arrive was the man who had sliced up the prints so impressively. Lestrade made an uncomfortable noise that did not quite become a word. I have spent my days retracing the movements of His Highness. I went from gambling, gambling hell to brothel to dining den to madhouse, looking for a pipe-smoking man and his friend. I made no progress until I, until I thought to check the newspapers of Bohemia, searching for a clue. Of recent activities there, and then I learned that an English theatrical trope had been in Prague last month and had performed before Prince Franz Drago. Good Lord, I said, so that Sherry Vernetho is a restorationist. Exactly. I was shaking my head in wonder at my friend's intelligence and skill of observation when there was a knock at the door. That will be our quarry, said my friend. Careful now. Lestrade put his hand deep into his pocket, where I had no doubt he kept a pistol. He swallowed nervously. My friend called out, Please come in. The door opened. It was not Vernet, nor was it a limping doctor. It was one of the street, young street Arabs who had, who in earth, and who in earn a crust running errands in the employ of Messrs. Street and Walker, as we used to say when I was young. Please, sirs, he said, is there a Mr. Henry Camberley here? I was asked by a gentleman to deliver a note. I'm he, I said, said my friend. And for six, for a sixpence, what can you tell me about the gentleman who gave you the note? The young lad, who volunteered his name, was Wiggins, bit the sixpence before making it vanish, and then told us that the cheery cove who gave him the note was on the tall side with dark hair, and, he added, he had been smoking a pipe. I have the note here, and taking the liberty of transcribing it. My dear sir, I do not address you as Henry Camberley, for it is a name to which you have no claim. I am surprised that you did not announce yourself under your own name, for it is a fine one, and, and one that does you credit. I have read a number of your papers when I have been able to obtain them. Indeed, I corresponded with you quite profitably two years ago about certain theoretical anomalies in your paper on the dynamics of an asteroid. I was amused to meet you yesterday evening. A few tips which might save you bother in times to come and the profession you currently follow. First, a pipe smoking man might possibly have a brand new unused pipe in his pocket and no tobacco, but it's exceedingly unlikely, at least as unlikely as a theatrical promoter with no idea of the usual customs of recompense on a tour who is accompanied by a tack turned ex army officer. Ex -af Afghanistan, unless I miss my guess. Incidentally, while you are correct that the streets of London have ears, it might also behoove you to, in the future not to take the first cab that comes along. Cab drivers have ears too, if they choose to use them. You are certainly correct in your su suppositions. It was indeed I who lured the half-blood creature back into, back into the room in Shoreditch. If it is any comfort to you, I have learned of little, a little of his recreational predilections. I had told him I had procured him for a girl, abducted from a con convent in Cornwall, where she had never seen a man, and that would only take his touch and the sight of his face to tip her over, tip her over into perfect madness. Had she existed, he would have feasted on her madness, while he took her, like a man sucking the flesh from a ripe peach, leaving nothing behind but the skin and pit. I have seen them do this. I have seen them do far worse. And nor the price we pay for peace and prosperity. It is too great a price for that. The good doctor, who believes as I do, and who did indeed write our little performance, for he has some crowd-pleasing skills, was waiting for us with his knives. I send this note, not as a catch for me, if you can taunt, for we are gone, the estimable doctor, and I, and you shall not find us, but to tell you that it was very good to feel that, if, on, if only for a moment, I had a worthy adversary, worthier by, by far 
than inhuman creatures from beyond the pit. I fear the strand players will need to find themselves a new leading man. I will not myself sign myself Burnett, and until the hunt is done and the world restored, I beg you to think of me simply as Rach. Inspector Lestrade ran from the room, calling to his men. They made young Wiggins take them to the place where the man had given him the note for all the world as if Vernette the actor would be waiting for them th a smoking of his pipe. From the window we watched them run, my friend and I, and we shook our heads. They, they will stop and search at all the trains leaving London, all the ships leaving Albion for Europe or the New World, said my friend. Looking for a tall man and his com companion, a smaller, th thick set medical man with a slight limp. They will close the ports. Every way out of the country will be blocked. You think they will catch him then? My friend shook his head. I may be wrong, he said, but I would wager that he and his friend are even now only a mile or so away in the rookery of St. Giles, where the police will not go except by the dozen, and they will hide up there until the hue and cry have died away, and then they will be out about their business. What makes you say that? Because, said my friend, if our positions were reversed, it is what I would do. You should burn the note, by the way. I frowned. But surely it's evidence, I said. It's seditionary nonsense, said my friend. And I should have burned it. Indeed, I told Lestrade I had burned it when he returned, and he congratulated me on my good sense. Lestrade kept his job, and Prince Albert wrote a note to my friend congratulating him on his deductions while regretting that the perpetrator was still at large. They have not yet caught Sherry Vernet, or whatever his name really is, nor was any trace of his murderous accomplice tentatively identified as the former military surgeon named John, or perhaps James Watson. Curiously, it was revealed that he was, had also been in Afghanistan. I wonder if we ever met. My shoulder touched by the queen she continues to improve. The flesh fills and heals. Soon I shall be a dead shot once more. One night, when we were alone, several months ago, I asked my friend if he remembered the correspondence referred to in the letter from the man who signed himself Rach. My friend said that he remembered it well and that Sigerson, for so the actor had called himself then, claiming to be an Icelander, had been inspired by an equation of my friends to suggest some wild theories furthering the relationship between mass, energy, and the hypothetical speed of light. Nonsense, of course, said my friend, without smiling, but inspired and dangerous non nonsense nonetheless. The palace eventually sent word that the queen was pleased with my friend's accomplishments in the case, and there, there the matter was rested. I doubt my friend will leave it alone, though. It will not be over until one of them has killed the other. I kept the note. I said I have said things in this retelling of events that are not to be said. If I were a sensible man, I would burn all these pages. But then, as my friend taught me, even ashes can give up secrets. Instead, I shall place these papers in a strong box at my bank with instructions that the box may not be opened until long after anyone now is living is dead. Although, in the light of the recent events in Russia, I fear that one that the day may be closer than any of us would care to think.